ocho si Papa Gilonda a la oque ocho si a Gilonda o ma ocho si o te manda ocho si Papa Gilonda a la oque ocho si a Gilonda worship community it's very important today as it has been throughout the history of this ocean ultra world to preserve our traditions okay preserving our tradition in the face of change though because we are definitely changing in this world in that it's very important that we look to our elders to tell their story as it relates to the ultra worship at this place and at this time. Now, the ultra community around the world is in need of this particular story that we're about to do today, okay? Um, and it's, it's important that we get this story as it is expressed by Manny Vega. Thank you. Okay? Now, but why Manny Vega, okay? What makes your story important to this community? Okay. Um, there are basically two elements, okay, upon which we can focus that need to be brought out to our community. That is one, that as a Orisha worshiper, you were initiated not in the Lukumi system but in the Candobre system. And there are not too many of us here in the United States that we know of to tell that story. The other element is the fact that you're an artist and that you express your art, your life of the, the Ocha community through these works that, um, that are around this, this, this wonderful, wonderful place that we are here Thank you. doing this documentary. In that, there are a few questions that perhaps we can pose to you and you can answer so we can you know, get an idea of what it is you are about and how our ultra community can benefit from, from your experience, from this wonderful experience. Well, I'll try my best. Okay. All right. Um, let me start by you know, first asking, what was it that led you to walk through the door of ultra worship? Um, how can I say, it, it's, it's a long evolution, long process, and a lot of it, it was actually perhaps subconscious. Um, as with most people, I, I, it's important for me to say that I was born and raised in New York City, Puerto Rican uh, ancestry. My parents were born in Puerto Rico. They came here in 56. I was born in the Bronx, and uh, I was exposed to a polycultural society, you know, a community. It was not only uh, American, white American, but it was also Latino, Italian, Jewish, in the projects up in Webster Avenue. The storefronts in the neighborhood were also polycultural in their own sense. We had a Catholic church on one side, we had a, a spiritual botanical goods store on the other side of the street, and everything in between. Um, I either directly or indirectly was uh, affected by it as, as a sponge absorbing everything around me. Um, I, I was born and raised in the Catholic tradition, baptized, Holy Communion, everything, but there was just something more uh, regarding my, my spiritual uh, uh, evolution. Uh, and a lot of it, it, at the time, I didn't know how to access it it would be accessed through the music. Uh, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood where street drumming was very important. Uh, street drumming was just as important as playing basketball. One had to play a good, uh, what we call a good tumbao, a good bass beat, and uh, accompany the other drummers and take turn in kind. And um, the, the music at the time was um, a lot of Afro-Cuban music, but also a uh, little bomba en plena from Puerto Rico. Um, and it was a, a, a very conscious effort on my part and my friends 
to uh, ask who we were culturally, and the music was there accessible that way. I, I have to give a lot of credit to Latin music, to jazz, you know, for being the first uh, uh, communities to actually emphasize that we had cultural elements that had to be preserved. Um, and you know, when you're interested in something, you have a thirst to constantly learn more about it. So I was very fortunate in that I was able to to go to a, a, a jam session here, or a party there. At the time, the Orisha community, what we call the Ocha community, was very private, very secluded, and ceremonies were very closed off. So I didn't really have access to any uh, spiritual community other than the botanical goods store that Radio had access to. But a botanical goods store is just that, a botanical goods store. Um, I went through a whole soul search, which in 84 led me to my first trip to Brazil, which I went for actually for the same reasons, to discover music and culture, and have fun while I was going about it. I didn't know what was waiting for me over there was something a lot more evolved, a lot more important in my life, and that was uh, engaging in a very, very important um, spiritual community who would later on adopt me as uh, their property, <laughs> a child of the community. I can't speak for either Nigeria or Cuba because I haven't been there. But it, going back and forth to Bahia and Rio de Janeiro for the last 16, 17 years, uh, big if difference is the actual day-to-day -day living in um, Bahia especially is infused with a lot of just Africanism. Mm -hmm. um, in the cuisine, there's palm oil everywhere, you know, there's uh, the, the food, the street food, uh, the most common street food is called akaraje, which is what akara, bean cakes that are served in the marketplace in Nigeria. And even aside from the spiritual aspects of the, the culture from Nigeria and Benin and Angola that presides over Brazil, it's such a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, um, element that it is almost like the binder of the culture okay, in Bahia specifically, so much so that they call Bahia the Black Rome, Roma Negra. Um, and you see it in the music, in samba, in carnaval. Um, it's a very uh, accepted part of culture, cultural society. And they have the same problems that we have in our country with racism and all that too, but I don't know, it's, it's a lot more subtle in certain ways and a lot more accepting of these elements of the culture. Um, I don't think that people in Brazil are any more spiritual than anybody else, but they have been able to preserve a lot of their cultural heritage and their cultural history. I think in preserving their whole cultural history has been uh, uh, the main factor in allowing them to preserve their heritage as well. They're both, you know, um, they, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. and, and along with that, um, the same as us, they're able to adopt to the year 2003 as well uh, in a very uh, clever way sometimes. But uh, they suffer from the same, um, uh, I wouldn't call them setbacks, but the same tribulations that we would face of not comp compromising the integrity of the religion or not compromising authenticity um, by uh, mass production, uh, mass uh, consumership, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or the commer commercialization of the religion. It happens over there, too. Um, being that slavery was abolished 100 years later in Brazil than from the rest of uh, this hemisphere, that had a lot to do with a lot of uh, uh, the preserving of the culture. Although slavery was a very difficult and negative chapter 
it did allow for the preservation of a lot of these traditions. Because from what I understand, the slave masters in Brazil used to keep the families together really? as opposed to dispersing them. And in keeping the, the families together, they would keep, the families would keep the language and the traditions together intact as opposed to being di dispersed. Um, and, and that helped in preserving a lot of the oral tradition, a lot of the, the cuisine, a lot of the, the ritual practices, the song and dance. And as you say, that is the key to being able to um, really practice fully. Um, that's the language and the lifestyle as it is being preserved. Um, well, it's very important to know how the people before us practiced and how they, not just practiced, but how they, they evolved. We, we have to uh, give major credit to our elders because they came to this new world, which had nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, they were able to adopt the, the flora, the fauna of this hemisphere to something that they were accustomed to in their homeland, which was either Benin, Nigeria, Angola, the Congo, Bantu. Um, very clever on their part to be able to adopt one lifestyle into another um, uh, physical environment, which is this country, under uh, tremendous uh, persecution from not just slave masters, but history itself. Um, as we have evolved, are there any people today that you might see as being instrumental in your growth, in your development, in as as a practitioner or as a priest in the Orisha community? Well, I, I have to give credit to absolutely anybody who wears Ileke. <laughs> <laughs> which requires, a, 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 you know, if they're doing it correctly, it requires a, a lot of steadfast de dedication, devotion, a lot of introspection, painful introspection sometimes, because that's what Odisha wants you to do. Um, they are particular people in my life that I was blessed with being um, uh, uh, sur uh, surrounded by in certain time. Uh, main figures are uh, Mike Leosa, Millet, uh, and her mother, my Mini Nia do Gantua, which was a famous um, Oshun priestess of Brazil, and her daughter was a famous priestess of Nanan, who took me in as actually a friend of the family. Before anything else, I was just a friend of the family, and they gave me that type of confianza, that type of confidence. I had to earn trust like everybody else, and I appreciated going through that process like everybody else. So I was not treated like a anybody special. Um, I had to go through the grinder in Brazil like everybody else. Just the fact that I was American or that I was uh, a foreigner did not uh, really um, uh, have too much of a, an impact on my process, although it did have an impact on my evolution, mm -hmm. being that here in New York I had access to a lot of things that people in Brazil didn't have access to, um, mainly information historical information, not just about the religion and, and Orisha, but my own personal, you know, family lineage, and having to correlate that together with my spiritual practice, which is my current project. That's interesting. Um. But credit goes to my Cleosa, my Mininia, my Kalmen, which are the three principal elders of my temple, which is called Ile Iyaomi Asheyamase, which is the second founding temple of Candomblé of Ketu, uh, Ketu Candomblé, which comes specifically from Abelkuta, Nigeria. Is it very much of a difference? I mean, I know that you have lived in this community here in the United States all your life, born here, um, and traveling there. Do you see much of a difference in the process of the of the religion and? Well, I don't know what well the big difference is that we have actual temples in Bahia ah. that are founded, that, that, that the land is consecrated to the deity and the community, founded by a community. Our, our specific temple was founded in 1849 by um, my Julia Figueiredo, who was the uh, granddaughter of uh, the elder who founded the first temple called Ile Iyanaso Oka, uh, which is called Casa Branca. 
These are three elders that were slaves in Brazil who were able to buy their freedom from their slave masters, returned to Brazil, I mean, returned to Nigeria, lived there for a good 20 years, learning about specific traditions, uh, Shango in Oyo, Oshun in Oshobo, et cetera, et cetera. After 20 years coming back with specific elders, um, and upon coming back, creating a, a confederacy of the religion, the very founding of the religion, under the auspices of the Alaketu nation. Um, I say this because just like uh, in this country and in Cuba, the, the migration that came from Nigeria or from Africa in general did not just come from Nigeria. It came from Angola, from Benin. It came from uh, um, the Bantu. It came from Congo. Um, and those practices, those, those specific religions and traditions and communities landed in Brazil and were pretty much mixed up together. So you could imagine the problems that they had with communicating and with ritual practice. These elding, uh, elder uh, women were able to formulate a ritual, um, a ritual tradition, a ritual uh, 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 meeting of people from these different areas and create uh, a ceremony that celebrated, that gave turn for everyone to come together and celebrate as a community. I say this because when one goes to Nigeria and one would go to uh, Ile Ife, well, it's very likely that almost everybody in that town has some kind of affiliation that was consecrated to Obatala, or the deities of white, Fung Fung, or Obamoro, or Dudua, et cetera, et cetera. If you go to um, Oyo, your family and your you and everybody else around you is probably under the auspices of Shango. If you go to Ekiti, it's under the auspices of Ogun. If you go to uh, Ede, Ilobu, it's Logun Ede, it's, it's uh, the hunter deities. And so, uh, you know, nobody bought a ticket to come to Brazil. They were forced to come here the, 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 as slaves. And when they came, to this part of the world, they formulated, you know, amongst themselves, how to keep their practices intact by supporting each other's ritual. So um, we'll go to a ceremony in, in Casa Branca, and they take turns uh, celebrating, uh, venerating Ogun first, and Elegba, Ogun, Oshosi, Shango, et cetera, et cetera, giving turn to each member of the community that comes from a different part of Africa to celebrate as a community, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and that was how the initial uh, um, Orisha religions were founded in Brazil. I have to say also that alongside with the tradition of Orisha, what we call Ocha, in Brazil, was a very strong emphasis in Baba Egun. Baba Egun meaning the ancestral Egun lineages that people had very intact in, in uh, Brazil because they had them intact when they arrived in Brazil from Nigeria. So they were able, especially the, the uh, because that's really a, a very male-oriented tradition of Baba Egun. And uh, from what I understand, um, in Bahia, uh, there was also a Gelade tradition, uh, which is where the men honor feminine power and the feminine elders. That's something that is very, very, very key in Nigeria, in Abelkuta, in the towns where Yimoja and Oshun are, are, are venerated. And for the early part of, of uh, the 20th century, in Brazil, there was a Gelade tradition. Okay? There, there is a Baba Egun tradition, which is different from Orisha. Okay? These are uh, different, I guess, ways of venerating our spirituality. Not just Orisha, but ancestral spirits on one side, feminine power on the other. Okay. It seems as if you're, you're 
saying that I, the, um, there, was a, there is a cohesiveness between the peoples of, of, of the religion as it's practiced, the way you spoke of preserving those elements of the tradition. Here, though, in the United States, I know at some point we had talked about barriers between people of Ocha. Do you see how do you see how that might play into, or is there something that we might be able to learn from that, so that there can be um, some more cohesiveness between the communities within here in the United States? Um, well, I, I could only. Not, a, not just use myself as an individual example, but emphasize that, um, you know, I, I can't carry that baggage. I, my, my purpose and my mission, you know, has evolved from my own uh, desire to, to find out what it is. I did not plan to get initiated in Brazil. It was just something that obviously was marked and waiting for me. Um, and I'm trying to not only remain loyal to it, but I realize that I'm forever the student uh, in doing so. And it's a long, evolved process which will probably consume my entire life. And I'm very happy with that commitment. Um, I think regarding the barriers that exist here, especially the political barriers, the color barriers, the, the status barriers, the financial barriers, Th they exist in Brazil as well. It's just part of the big picture. And um, they do have impact in your own individual process. But it's part of your test, too. Orisha does test you and wants to know pure is the water. How pure is your effort? What are you in this for? You know? uh, and um, because as, as we know, a lot of people are in this tradition out of some kind of fad. They do it uh, because it's in style. It's a very chic thing to do, or wear white clothing and beads, without realizing the, 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 the commitment that's involved. And um, you know, it's that specific commitment is meant for everybody, but it's not everybody who's going to comply to it. Um, as long as you know, uh, I'm still the student and I'm still engaged in learning and evolving and working with the community, then, you know, it, it sounds very selfish, but I'm, I'm, I'm in my own world, pretty much. Um, but I'm also a grain of sand in the beach. <laughs> you know, I am part of the, this big community. And the community is counting on me for me to stay focused on my own individual process. Um, and that's the best that I can tell my brothers and sisters to actually, uh, you know, emphasize their, 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 their personal mission as a contribution to the community, you know. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, most definitely. Uh, and, and that requires less talk and more action, actually. That requires praying on your own and, you know, telling the elders, your elders, what you've done to help the community as opposed to counting on the community and the elders to save your life all the time, you see? Because we're, we're supposed to be pillars to hold up a roof together, all of us, not, not crutches to help each other stand up. I mean, that happens anyway. But if we were all pillars, and you hold your weight, you hold your weight, we can all hold this roof together. I learned in Bahia. Um, in Bahia, you were you were initiated as a priest of Ochoce. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how Ochoce manifests in your life and um, a little bit about what we need to know about this wonderful Orisha, how it fits into the theme of life, as does Oshun, as does Shango, as do, does Obata. Mm -hmm. But to you, um, what is it about Well, I, I didn't know who my guardian spirit was when I entered upon this realm. I, I had a very strong attraction to Shango, as all men do, because, you know, the drumming, the dancing, the passion and all that, that is emphasized, especially here, in, in Latin music and Cuban music. And it wasn't until 
1985, my first uh, divination with one of the elders in Bahia, that it revealed itself that I was a child of Oshosi with Obatala, put a strong emphasis on uh, being overseen by Oshun as well. Um, and upon discovering that, you know, that unto itself is a death rebirth. Um, when you accept, you know, your, your, your guardian spirits, then they reveal themselves a little bit more to you. I, I was able to realize that oh, Shasi was a very um, individualistic deity, very uh, austere, very independent, as I am. Um, deity of providence, deity of uh, supply, a, a provider, as a hunter goes to the woods to provide, to, to hunt and come back to the community providing protein. But he's a, 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 a very, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of solitude in this, in this uh, figure, in this deity, who prefers to be in the woods alone. He has this communi communion with the trees, with the animals. Um, it's a dialogue that does not exist with the other deities. Um, a lot of courage, deity of courage, absolutely, of uh, steadfast tenacity, of very willful deity. Um, and in that sense, very magical, because I, I have the ability to see an image in my head and manifest that image with my hands. And it's very much, I've correlated it with the metaphor of the archer, bow and arrow, which is what Oshosi also is about. Um, the ability to envision something and, and go after it, um, all in one effort, in one s swept effort. And once you attain it, to share it for the good of the community. Oshosi is also, in, in Brazil, emphasized as the pioneer deity who would go to uh, the woods in a place where nobody's been and create a little encampment, a little shed, a little encampment somewhere, and go back to town and invite his friends over to that encampment. And while his friends are hanging out in that little encampment, they turn the little encampment into a little town, into a city, all right, while he's off creating another encampment. So in that, sen in that sense, he's a trailblazer, you know. And I, I feel that I am very much a trailblazer, especially in my artwork, because I, I'll go to areas that people, um, that I here in New York have not seen people uh, delve in um, yet. Or maybe they have and I have not been exposed to it. Um, all in due time. Um, but when I go to Bahia and the, the elders see my work, they. They, they give me all types of, uh, of support systems, uh, providing not only information and insight, but seeing to it that I partake, partake in specific rituals so I could learn. They consider me a good investment. They say that I'm, I have good hands, that I could, uh, um, I could uh, uh, be uh, an, an asset to the community. And I think that's something that I needed to hear because you know we want to do good. We just don't know how to do good. And somehow that's the, that's the problem with a lot of us here in terms of our identity search. We want to be something in life, but it's hard to formulate on our own. When our community counts on us and tells us this is what we need from you, um, and it's doable, then you know, it makes the path uh, a lot more palatable. It makes things uh, a lot more uh, you know, sensible that you know, people are counting on me in my temple to provide for Oshosi, to represent him with uh, whatever, my chipping in, together with other brothers and sisters of the same deity. And it makes sense to me. If I know it makes sense to me, then the dime that you give me, I'll turn into $1,000, because I know why you gave it to me. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, most definitely. Yeah. So I I in that sense, Oshosi has provided me with this um, knowledge that I know that he looks out for me. If I know that he looks out for me, then I'm going to trust him. And if I'm going to trust him, I'm not going to doubt him. And if I'm not going to doubt him, then it's going to show in my work, in my efforts, in my belief system. 
And this is where I become more tenacious, more willful, because somehow I know the end result will be a good one. He has not let me down yet. You um, just spoke about your beliefs and your efforts and how you express it through your art. And this is the most, to me, the, um, the meaty part of, of the interview because from what I see of your art, you talk about making life palatable just by being able to look at how you express the rendition of life. It is very ocean, very, very flowing, very beautiful, very, um, it shows the abundance of the earth, you know, through plants, through the colors, through, through experience. Um, in that, what is, tell me a little bit about the history of your art um, endeavors. What is it? How did, how did you come about? Well, as I said before, I grew up, I was born in the Bronx, and I grew up pretty much in public housing <laughs> in the Bronx and East Harlem, uh, with the same peer pressures that any other kid in the Bronx had, playing basketball, you know, this and that, and, you know, a little street fight here and there once in a while, you know, a little scuffle. Um, I had the ability then to draw and paint a little bit, so much that I used to use the art as a sort of like a companion. Um, and it wasn't until um, I went, I was 14 years old and I had to decide what high school to go to, uh, as opposed to all the provincial offers that all my other friends had made um, to go to either um, DeWitt Clinton for sports or or Alfred E. Smith for auto mechanics or something like that, or one of the Catholic high schools. I went to the High School of Art and Design. At a very young age, from 14 to 18, I was exposed to good art, good artists that happened to be the art teachers of the school. Um, I was a clown, I was a cut up at the time, but I did have one facet or two that was really taking and absorbing that whole art scene um, in that school. And it, it kind of uh, blossomed, especially when I graduated. Uh, I didn't go to college. I went, I went to Pratt Institute, but that only lasted two weeks. And that, that, I guess, was a blessing in disguise because it forced me to actually um, create my own process, my own creative process. It forced me to ask questions about my myself, you know, culturally, my, my heritage, my, my own history, you know. And um, um, back in 76, 77, it was a different scene then. There was an art scene, a uh, grassroots art scene. There were murals in New York City. There were a few community groups, uh, community art collectives. One that I have to give a lot of credit to was El Taller Boricua, a Puerto Rican arts collective in East Harlem, the Museo del Barrio, Bob Blackburn and his printmaking workshop. These, was, these were like little huts, little caves that I would go and gravitate to and meet other artists and wh how they say, make my bones, okay? Um, I was interested in public art, not necessarily graffiti, because I, I'd like to paint, paint, you know, in the classical sense with brush. And so um, I was involved in my first murals, public murals in, 1979, 1980, through city arts and public commissions here and there. Um, and my, my name started to be perpetuated amongst the, the communities in the Bronx and East Harlem more. Um, I was very much into music, so I would do um, posters, images for album jackets, t-shirt designs, and created a sort of a, um, aesthetic style that uh, created an audience that was looking forward to my next image. And at the same time, I, you know, in, in subliminal ways, I was incorporating the Orisha here and there, even if I didn't know it. Um, but when I was initiated, uh, and I saw how in the religion in Bahia, how the visual art was being used to serve, to emphasize the Ashe of the house through cloth, through beadwork, 
through uh, the actual decoration of a public space, uh, I realized that my creative talents could be utilized in service of the community and that I could really sink my teeth into it because I really believed in it. Okay, which again, I go back to saying, I think mo most of us need something to believe in. And in that sense, uh, my elders, they saw me as like a major asset. So I, I started pretty much intuitively doing a lot of this work, the bead work for the, for the temple. Um, elders of the temple would tell me a lot about details, the color code, the number code, the, all the symbols. Nothing was decorative. Everything had a said uh, coded language about it, all right? And that's just what I needed, you know, to remain engaged and interested in the topic. You know, like I said, when you love something, as a student, you are very willing to, to take on more and more information about it because there's, a, there's a, just a thirst to uh, fulfill with this knowledge and experience, you know. There's nothing more fulfilling to me than to um, create a crown or costume for a ceremony and have it used by Orisha, like Shango, in a public ceremony. And in the ceremony, there's no photography allowed. So every member in the, the temple who is present for that ceremony becomes the camera, okay? And they carry that image in their heads and then in their hearts. Okay, that to me is the, the art that I'm interested in more than anything else. Uh, because it really not only empowers me, but empowers the deity that looks out for me. Because there's a lot of trust there. We're not doing this to be published. We're doing this to publish the moment amongst ourselves. You see? That was good, right? <laughs> we have 17 Oshosis. Okay, it's a code name. It's like a generic name, Oshosi, you know? Uh, and, and my specific Oshosi is actually here, is considered Inle, who's the, the child of Yemoya, right? right. Yemoya. But Inle is actually uh, the hunter of elephants, elephant hunt, uh, provider and defender of the town of Ilobu, and the husband of Oshun Iponda. Okay, she seduces him in the water, and they have this child together called Logungade. For six months, he becomes his father, and for six months, he becomes his mother. You know. The Cubans in, in, in Matanzas know of this deity, although they don't call him Logungade. You know, they know him by, by some other name. But here, nobody has a clue as to... Never you know, heard of him. Exactly. Just like here, people that don't, they don't know who Shumar is. When you go to Haiti, or you go to Brooklyn, and you say, Dambala Ida Wedu, everybody knows who that is. Mm -hmm. That's the supreme uh, uh, deity, serpent deity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, in, and in, in the Candomblé, in our temple, everybody knows who Oshumare is. Oshumare is the brother of Ovaluaye, who is the child of Nana. You know? It's the Dalmain aspect. Yeah. It comes from Benin, not from Nigeria. It comes from their primordial, primordial deities. They're deities that appeared before metal, okay? That's why people wonder, why, why does Nana hate Ogun? Because Ogun represents metal, all right? And Nana and Obaluaye and, and those deities were there before. They're the primordial deities, before the discovery of metal. Ogun came with metal and revolutionized things, sort of making them obsolete. You know, and they don't, they, they, they're not for that, <laughs> you know. That's why in o o Omolu's, Obaluaye's clothing, there's no metal. You know, it's wood and bone, you know what I mean? Yeah. Stone. Yeah. It's all stuff from the earth, you know.
talked about sending our children to study in Africa and how the egg babes should make regular trips to the homeland to make this our Mecca. Um, could you give a, la a little bit more elaboration on that? Well, as, as you know, there have been conferences um, in the past, I think organized by Mata Vega and the Caribbean Cultural Center and one day Abimbula and his people and now and then, I think this year even, there's going to be another conference in, in Havana. Um, and uh, I've I, I partaken in one here, the one in 1986 here. Um, they have their place in terms of, uh, you know, a, a gathering place for, for elders and, and the uh, public at large to I guess get us to recognize that we are all the same religion with different nuances. But I personally uh, feel that, you know, that's a done deal already. You know, I mean, this is the year 2003. I already know personally that in Matanzas and Havana, Orishas there, that in Haiti, Orishas there, that in Brooklyn, Orishas there, that in Nigeria, Orishas there. So it's not a, for me, it's not so important to go there and let them know that I'm here also. It's more important to actually do ritual, if at all possible, okay? Do I trust my practice enough that I would be accepted by communities there? Well, I should. My initiation was a real one, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? When people meet me, when elders meet me, you know, that's what they should see, okay? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't mean to sound, you know, cocky about it, but it's what, you know, I have to have that type of trust in my evolution that I can go. If I'm a child of, of Oshosi, that I can go to Nigeria and meet up with other Oshosi priests just to share a beer with them. That's enough of a ritual for me, personally, you know. It's, it's, uh, it would enhance my own um, evolution as a practitioner human being have a good time while I'm at it. And then something up there that I'm not even thinking about will probably come up that is part of my evolution as well. Um, I went to Brazil with that attitude and I have evolved tremendously because of it. But I think the basis of my evolution is my faith in what I've done so far, you know? Together with some humility, <laughs> you know, because you, know, you do crash up against the wall sometimes and you're supposed to learn from that. Um, I think it's very important for, especially since we have egg base here, we have groups of people with a shared deity. If, if, if the egg base Oshun, the Awo Oshun knows that they have a place in Nigeria where Oshun is, her, her, it's a birthplace, then I, I think individually, each member should have that desire the same way that a Muslim has a desire to go to Mecca for a jihad once in their life. I think once in your life, you should have the interest in bathing in, in Oshobo, in the river, in the waters. Also, as a support system, I mean, what, what, would, it be, what would it be for those people who are still there in Oshobo, still practitioners of the religion on the major uh, 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 how you say pressure from you know their neighbors who are now Muslim or Catholic or whatever to maintain the traditions of Oshun to receive support moral support and help from members practitioners all around the world to come to their backyard and say look we're here because we got Oshun's back too that's I mean I know I know what it means you know because I've that's how my community in Bahia counts on me for. So, but that's my own individual pers you know, perspective. I know how important it is for me. I assume that it would be important also for a practitioner you know, to go to their hometown. Regarding youth you know, and young folk, and you know, to, say, to say what I said is one thing, but to actually do it would be another. To send a child over to Nigeria to learn Ifa. Well, it's an ideal scenario because in, in order to really learn Ifa, one has to learn from childhood. That's the way it's been in Nigeria and that's the way it still is. Um, although in Havana, thank God, the tradition of Ifa has been very well intact. Um, 
I don't know how likely is it that we can send young folk to Havana to learn. That's very unlikely. It's also unlikely to send young folk to Nigeria. When, how are they going to live? What are they going to be uh, sustained by? A grant? A, you know, a, a fellowship? It doesn't exist yet. We're not thinking that way yet. So we, we fall, uh, I don't mean victim, but we are, um, you know, we, we could only access what comes over here, all right, to present itself as diviners and owl, okay, as opposed to us, you know, evolving with that practice of Ifa specifically. So it, it would take a lot of courage for a family to send one of their children over there, but I think it's very possible. It's happened before. It's happened in Bahia. That's how the religion was founded, by elders sending their kids over there and coming back with the kids more grown and evolved as priests evolved in Bahia, okay, I mean evolved in Nigeria, come back to Brazil to, to be the elders, okay? It's not gonna happen to everybody, but we do need one, two, or three of them here in the future somehow. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible but because it already happened, it already indicates to me that it is possible. Um, in that, is there anything as a message that you might have to inspire the young people coming up in this ultra community and in this, um, these folks who worship Orisha? in the new world. Things are changing. Music, art, just the way of life is changing. And it has a strong impact, of course, on families and of course on our children. Um, as our children are growing and uh, they're learning a little bit more about this religion, is there any message that you might have to give to this young one? Um. Yes, and this message correlates according to my own uh, way of life and how I live my life. Um, prayer didn't make sense to me until um, I got on my knees, not because somebody told me to, but because I had to. And that started at a very young age. Um, that um, we, uh, you know, as human beings, you know, we, we're, we're more, much more than just uh, uh, flesh and bone. We have this spiritual facet that has to be addressed. It completes us. It, it makes us, it formulates us as a community as well. Um, and life does kick us in the butt as, as kids, as you know, adults or whatever, whereas once in a while you are forced to face God, once in a while. I think the younger the better. Um, I think uh, right now in the year 2003 that any uh, child, any, anybody, you know, at the age of 14, 15, and 16 that's beginning to ask, well, what is God? What does God look like? It requires a lot of courage right now because there's so much distraction from asking that question, much more than before. Um, and, and yet there's much more a need to ask that question. Who is God? What is God? How does God work and formulate in my life? How does this work, this mystery? Okay, um, the younger that you find out, the beginning of that answer, because that answer takes your whole life to, you know, to, to reveal itself. The younger that you realize that, that, that those are issues that, that formulate you and complete you, the better. Um, and, and as far as spiritual practice goes, whether it's Ocha, whether it's uh, the church, whether it's just practicing uh, Buddhism, or practicing yoga at home, if it, if, it, if it taps into that spiritual water, it's, it's good. And, and I have to say that I have confidence in youth that way. But I'm counting on them to find the water on their own, as I did, okay? Because when somebody provides the water for you, you don't appreciate it as much as finding it through your own struggle. And that struggle is inevitable. We're all gonna suffer. You know, uh, whether we suffer more or less than each other, that's irrelevant. The point is, in that suffering, we are going to be shown the door 
whether we have the guts to pass through that door or not, that, you know, again, that's an individual approach. Most definitely. Most definitely. Uh, uh, does that answer your question more or less? Okay, Baba, this has been a very interesting, very wonderful interview. You've given me a lot to go on. You know, you've answered a many, many questions that I've had, and I'm sure the, the entire Ocha community and outside of the Ocha community, we will all benefit from this great information. Is there anything else that you might want to comment on before well, I, I think it's time to bring everything up a notch. These are very uh, special times right now, um, and time is precious. Uh, it, it's about um, real communion with, with nature, with the earth especially. It's about the community taking um, the word community more seriously and, and dissolving whatever uh, issues that we have with each other. Although, you know, that's all part of the big picture as well. But if we can be uh, a, a, a more forgiving of each other's, uh, you know, flaws or, or defects and more accommodating to whatever we have to offer each other, I think we can evolve. Maybe not the way they've evolved in Nigeria or Brazil or Cuba, because New York has got a, an evolution of its own. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing because we have a, a, a vast a realm of resources here that other parts of the world don't have. And this puzzle is ours to solve, nobody else's. Well, I can say is thank you. 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 don't have then you know what you have mm -hmm. and that's where you can go forward mm -hmm. you know you really have to clean house with you know the the gray area mm -hmm. you know really before you go it. forward sure yeah and it's and painful like the queen of the crops, it was. yeah <laughs> it's usually that yeah it's usually that but once you do that and you start from that you know the, what you have to work with will not betray you and, that, and that's a good start. That's a good starting point. Anyway, let's begin. Okay. Mm. How many acres of land is there here, Bobby? Huh? How many acres of land do you have? 25. 25 acres? Yeah. Oh, we go way back.
huh? Yeah, we have another stream back there. A lot of mountains back there. Basha, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he loves it. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Come on, baby, come on. Come on. We gotta keep her away from your, yeah. from your uh, she equipment. Was okay. equipment. Come on, baby. Oh, serious. And he climbs up there and he meditates in the morning. Wow. Yeah. They come here like at five in the morning, then the deer, they come from up yeah. the slope and they come and they, they drink from the They home. drink and they rest, they hang out, and before seven o'clock they're gone. Basha, come. Basha, come on, baby. Wow. But you make Ochozi very happy. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just giving him back what he gives me. Come on, baby. Come on. He just retrieves anything. This is wonderful. Yeah, let's um, feel the form mm -hmm. of the water. And this morning the birds was chirping. I wish I had the camera this morning. Oh, 